Segway, to continue at once with the next musical selection or composition. Segway, to make a transition directly from one section or theme Segway, to another. Segway, to move smoothly and unhesitatingly from one state, situation, condition, or element to another. Segway, to perform in the manner of the preceding section. Segway, to make a transition from one thing to another smoothly and without interruption. This is Segway with Dean Aldemaro Romero, a weekly program exploring the lives and work of the people of the College of Arts and Sciences at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. Hello, everybody. Dr. Mac Hinson was born in Charlotte, North Carolina. He obtained his bachelor's in music from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, his master's of music from the prestigious Juilliard School in New York, and his doctorate in music from Florida State University. Today, he's a professor of music at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. Welcome to Segway, Dr. Hinson. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Although it is unusual to call a musician doctor before because, you know, most people in the arts generally have an MFA, but why do you pursue a doctorate in music? Well, when I uh, graduated from the Juilliard School, I was working at, as a performer in Charleston, South Carolina. I was working as principal clarinet in the symphony, teaching at the college music appreciation class, and teaching private applied clarinet students. And as I got to teaching more at the college, I thought, you know, this might not be a bad job to be able to teach. I hadn't thought about it as a career because I was trained so much as a performer. But when I started to actually become more involved in teaching classes, then I thought that I would like to kind of see about this position as a, as a career. Uh, when I left Charleston, I went back to Colorado Springs uh, to get married and to uh, be with my wife. And I started again teaching music appreciation and, and, and uh private applied students in Colorado Springs. And then I decided that when, I, when we finally moved back to Charlotte in 1987 that I would pursue this. I thought I liked the students. I loved the actual um, aspect of teaching them and watching them learn. I still keep them up by performing, but I found a different path to take that I didn't really think about when I was at Juilliard. And I really decided that this was more of what I wanted to do as a career. Okay. Now, there is a stereotype of you know, musicians that all of them start playing an instrument very early on uh, in, in their life. Was that your case? Yes, I started playing when I was 10. Um, this is sort of an interesting story. Well, that's kind of old if you compare it with Mozart, for example. Well, <laughs> <not> that three. <laughs> actually, no, that's true. Uh, in my home, we didn't have any, any music. My mother uh, was an English teacher, and my father worked for Duke Power, which was uh, like Amarin here. And we didn't have um, any piano or anything like that, except for a huge collection of opera records. Uh -huh. And so I grew up with that on the stereo for, uh, for a while when I was younger. Um, when I was 10 in fifth grade, um, there was a band at my elementary school that I wanted to join. Now, for one thing, the cool place to be was in the band, and that's for sure, not in the orchestra. The orchestra in my elementary school was comprised of one player, one violinist. So, <laughs> <laughs> not much of us. Not section. much, much, much there. <laughs> so when I uh, when I went to the band, I wanted to play trumpet. You know, that was a manly instrument, and I wanted to be sure that I blew really loud. Mm -hmm. And the band teacher said, "I'm sorry, we're all filled up. We don't have any more room for trumpets." And I said, "Well, what's the easiest one then?" And th she said, "The clarinet." So. That was how I started with that, and I can tell you right now, that's not the case. <laughs> well, but I, I'm sure that uh, until that point, you probably didn't hear too much about clarinet as a you know, uh, top-of-the-line instrument in terms of, of being preferred by many people. No, it was, it was mainly the band that I was interested in, no matter what <laughs> instrument it was. If I was in the band, that was good enough for me. Though the band had pizza parties, we went out to parades, mm -hmm. we did Thanksgiving parade. I mean, that was a place to be socially and for, for fun. It wasn't until my ninth grade, um, this would be junior high school, that a, a, a boy who was my age came down from Indiana to Charlotte. Mm -hmm. Indiana was really far away, and it was very unusual for him to come down. 
And I was principal clarinet at the time in ninth grade, um, not because I practiced, just because I had some talent and because I could play it okay. Mm -hmm. Well, we had challenges during that time, and uh, this guy challenged me, and he won. And I was mortified that he beat me. So I went over to him and I said, Bill, how did you beat me? And he goes, well, I'm taking private lessons. Oh, no, I said, you're taking private lessons? And he goes, yeah, from the symphony player in the Charlotte Symphony, and we're going over technique and rhythm and that sort of thing. And, and he beat me the whole rest of the year, and then the next year he left, so I got my job back. Now he's the principal clarinet of the Boston Symphony. Okay. So <laughs> I don't feel too bad. But at that point I started to question if I was really all that good. You know, if I had just gotten by on my talent for all these years or if I could really play or not. Um, and so I started to think about this, and in high school, um, 12th grade, senior year, I started taking lessons. And at that point, it became um, important to me that I wanted to better myself and to actually play. I got a new clarinet, and I actually won the principal clarinet position of the North Carolina All-State Band. So that was the, I was the best in the state at that point. Mm -hmm. I went to Chapel Hill on a scholarship, and the, fir the first lesson I got from my teacher there was, Mac, you're just not playing very well. And I'm going, what do you, what do you mean I'm not playing very well? <laughs> I was principal clarinet in the All-State Band. Well, you missed this, you missed that, your rhythm's not there, you're not tongue in there. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, it just was a big um, revelation to me that private lessons and, you know, working with uh, a good teacher was an important thing. And, and I started to just feel like I wanted to be better and not just goof off and yeah. rely on my talent. And then you went to Juilliard School. Right. And I don't think that most people outside the area of music really understands what does it mean to go to Juilliard School. So tell us, tell our audience, what does it mean to get, because it's very difficult to even be accepted to Juilliard School. Well, Juilliard, um, I, as I mentioned, uh, I grew up with opera when I was younger. And so I knew about uh, some of the major opera stars, Leontine Price and um, people like Pavarotti. And uh, New York and Juilliard was mentioned to me by my mother quite early on as being a very high prestigious the school. <laughs> Why, I'm not sure, but she, she mentioned to me. Mm. Later on, I noticed that there was a lot of people that had come from Juilliard. Robin Williams, uh, the actor, graduated mm -hmm. from there. Yeah. Wynton Marsalis, mm -hmm. trumpeter, was from there. There's a lot of people who actually came from that school besides music in drama, dance, performing um, this arts, type yeah, of yeah. performing arts. Yeah. yeah. So um, at my senior year, I was um, trying to figure out what to do with my next year because I knew the fall was coming up. At that point, I was working at Swinson's Ice Cream as a short order cook. <laughs> and so I said, well, I can either continue to work here in the summer and the fall or go to master's degree in graduate school. And I said, okay, well, if I'm going to go to graduate school, I'm going to Juilliard. So I <laughs> sent in my application. I got on a train in Chapel Hill. Um, there was this uh, lady there who brought on some uh, Jim Beam, and we sat there and drank Jim Beam all the way up to New York. A friend of mine had uh, a place in Brooklyn we stayed. And while I was in Brooklyn, I was trying to think of what could make me distinctive from all the other candidates that day. Because people audition at this prestigious music school all the time and don't get in. Yeah. And you have to figure out some way to make yourself different, um, if not better, at least different than the other person. Mm -hmm. So um, when I went into the audition, there were four clarinet teachers there. One was uh, principal of the New York Philharmonic. One was principal of the ballet orchestra. Um, the guy who taught the principal of the Philharmonic was there. And this other guy who was a doubler played in the CBS Radio Symphony on bass clarinet, saxophone, and clarinet. And so when I went into the audition, I had two pieces memorized that were quite difficult, that no one memorizes. They're so difficult. So I said, this is, this is going to be, I'm going to make myself different with this. So I played that, and then after the audition, I they asked me, what would you like to do at Juilliard? And I said, I want to study with Joe Allard, bass clarinet, clarinet, and saxophone. I wanted to learn all three instruments, and I wanted to make myself more versatile in that. 
And I don't think many people wanted to study with that guy because they wanted to study with the big guy, the oh. Philharmonic guy. Okay. And so when I mentioned to him that I wanted to study with him, I hope I interest him into taking me on. Oh, okay. So that was my plan, was to play something different and to ask for this teacher. Yeah. And I got in. That yeah. was the only place I applied. If I would have been back at Chapel Hill if I hadn't gotten yeah. in. So that was, that was it. Now, you have mentioned opera. You have mentioned the Philharmonic, all that kind of things. But the fact of the matter is clarinet is also a very popular instrument in jazz. Yes, it and, is. And uh, Benny Goodman, Artie Shaw, uh, Woody Herman. I mean, all these are famous clarinetists. And even Duke Ellington wrote a lot for clarinet. Uh, what do yes. you think has made clarinet so popular for jazz? I think that um, it has a uh, soulful sound to it that seems to be um, appealing to emotion. Um, in jazz versus classical, you often have a wide range of individual sounds, individual styles, and different types of emotion. And I think that from the popularity of Benny Goodman in particular, that he sort of set the pace of an emotional way to play clarinet. Before Benny Goodman, there was really nobody except for Johnny Dodds who played in the Louis Armstrong Hot Five and Hot Seven. Mm -hmm. And that was more of a Dixieland type of sound, mm -hmm. you know, and they mm -hmm. had trumpet, trombone, and clarinet in a Dixieland mm -hmm. lineup. Mm -hmm. But I think Benny Goodman really put the clarinet on the map with his soloing ability yeah. and his, in, his emotional um, presentation. And so Artie Shaw and these people, you know, pretty much focused on clarinet. Mm -hmm. I know Woody Herman played some saxophone, yeah. but you had people who just focused in on the clarinet. Yeah. But you'll notice today, after you get out of the swing era, clarinet is not quite as popular as it used to be. Yeah. You'll have it in Dixieland as a tradition and a heritage from Louis Armstrong. Mm -hmm. You also have mm -hmm. it in Klezmer, perhaps, on some Jewish music. Yeah. And But when you're talking a big band playing mm -hmm. or a combo playing like um, uh, Charlie Parker or yeah. some of these play, some of these people t even today with David Sanborn and whatnot, you don't hear clarinet as much as you used no. to, and I think it's because of Benny Goodman that we had a popularity. Now, clarinet also has been played by rock musicians, although many people may, may not be able to differentiate that from saxophone, for example. I can remember a slide in the Family Stone, mm -hmm. dance to the music, dance to the music, dee -dee -dee -dee. that part is played with the clarinet, but also yeah. Aerosmith, the Beatles have used clarinet, Pink Floyd has used clarinet. So right. it seems that somehow clarinet has become an instrument that is used by top musicians in different genera. That's true, that's true. I'm, I'm always amazed at how versatile the clarinet can be. For one thing, it can play uh, quite loud in the high register, and so mm -hmm. it can project. The soft register is often very mysterious and actually uh, can be more subdued, very maybe. more subdued. Yeah. So the w dynamic range of the yeah. clarinet is yeah. very good. And I think that um, the aspect of the bass clarinet in particular, which we're here today, has been used as much as the clarinet in like some jazz and some other areas like that. I know that uh, Frank, some of the Frank Sinatra mm -hmm. aspects from the 50s used mm -hmm. a lot of, of bass clarinet. Yeah. Miles Davis in his quintet uh, used bass clarinet. Eric Dolphy was a yeah. jazz person who used uh, bass clarinet. And so you'll get a pretty versatile range just between the low and the high and then the dynamics, which seem to appeal to people with the versatility of yeah. it. Well, the other thing uh, that you mentioned that is there's a tremendous range of clarinets, yes. from the piccolo clarinet to the contrabass clarinet. That's true. Uh, so, I mean, I, I remember going through uh, uh, in a music encyclopedia about all the different clarinet types. It is almost endless because in addition <laughs> to, the, to the more standard That's ones, scary. <laughs> people have come up with things that don't even look like a clarinet. <laughs> especially those lower ones, it yeah. gets to be so big that the wood that you need to make some of those low, lower clarinets uh, is very difficult to find. Mm -hmm. You have, when, you, when they're making uh, clarinets out of wood, you can't have any cracks or anything like that in it because it'll leak, just the sound will go through. So some of the metal clarinets, down to contrabass and even I've seen a, a bass clarinet that's made out of metal. Actually, looks so like an oil rig or some yeah. type of <laughs> some type of crazy thing. Um, but you get a lot of 
a variety from the highest to the lowest clarinets in both the band and the orchestra. Mm -hmm. um, some composers like David Gillingham, who's written for our group here, and who Kim Archer has actually gone to visit, writes specifically for some of these um, unusual clarinets, okay. especially it seems like the low clarinets mm -hmm. in particular with this buzzier, grittier, sort of more menacing sound mm -hmm. seems to appeal uh, to people in an yeah. in interesting way for composers at least. Well, and actually uh, we're going to be listening to some portions of your latest uh, CD um, and you play the bass uh, clarinet bass. For, for that and the title of that new album is Low Blow, a student uh, favorites uh, for brass, clarinet, and piano. Uh, I'm sorry, for bass, clarinet, and, and piano. Why do you choose that particular title? Well, I thought that, um, and this is sort of another little funny story, when the band went over to England, and uh, this is the Wind Symphony at SIU, when we went to England and to France in 2000, uh, one of our concerts in France was called All Blow. And I, <laughs> I thought that was funny. So I remembered the, the blow part for this, and I wanted to make a CD that had a title that would distinguish it from other, other clarinet CDs. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to make sure that they knew it was a bass clarinet. Um, it almost has a, 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 a characteristic of being hit, like if you get a low blow to the belly uh -huh. or something like that. So I thought that was kind of cute too. But um, I wanted to make sure that it had uh, the title that w went with what the music is. Okay. Well, now let's listen to a portion of one of those pieces called Gloucester by Pierre Laplante with Mac Hinson at the bass clarinet and Chris Pineda, who is another professor here at SIUE, at the piano. So let let's listen to it. <laughs> Okay, so tell me, why do you decide to do this particular CD? Because it has a title that seems like aimed towards the students or something like that. That's right. I, I had three reasons to do the CD. One was to um, have a model and have research the repertoire for my students here who play bass clarinet. Two was to produce the actual CD <clears throat> and to have myself get more familiar with the instrument, of which is a secondary instrument for me, but to become more familiar with the instrument, be able to teach it better when I have my students here, and to become familiar with the interpretation of the repertoire to make the CD. The third thing was I wanted to have um, enough CDs to send out to area band directors uh, and area musicians so that they could use it for their students to listen to for bass clarinet, um, there's not much on uh, YouTube or recording for the piano part in particular for this. And also, these, the choice of literature on the CD was from the IMEA and MMEA solo and ensemble lists. Mm -hmm. So the students could, in the high school, for recruitment, they could look this up, listen to my CD, maybe take a lesson with me, and they would know that this is an area for, for work. Okay, now let's listen uh, to a portion of Henri Eclair's Sonata in G minor. Thank you. 
Well, now that you talk about uh, your students, um, how much of interest is there among students to pursue clarinet as an instrument? It's pretty good. I have one of the largest studios in uh, the music department between clarinet and saxophone. Clarinet seems to be still a strong instrument in the high schools. Um, you have to have a, a number of them, like maybe 20 or so, in the bands in Collinsville, Alton, these area high schools, in order to get, a, get enough sound. So we generally have a pretty good recruitment day here uh, in February when we have our recruitment um, auditions for clarinets in particular. It doesn't seem to be as much as saxophone. I think saxophone is maybe uh, prettier or easier to play or sexier, sexier or whatever, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and clarinet is just a stick, you know, it yeah. doesn't quite look like the saxophone. But there's still a number of people who uh, like to play it enough in high school that we have a pretty good interest. When they come to SIU, um, we generally have uh, the B flat clarinet, the soprano instruments, mm -hmm. as the main instruments. But about every year, I'll have maybe one or two bass clarinets that will actually come and audition, and they just don't know any of the repertoire. They don't. Ha they've never taken a lesson. Um, they usually have an instrument from their high school that they play on, and so there's a lot of problems with bass clarinet in high school for actually producing a nice sound and for um, playing the repertoire. And sometimes here at SIU, we'll have to move somebody over to bass clarinet to play in the band if there's not one available, or in the orchestra. And both band and orchestra use um, a bass clarinet all, all the time. So you've got to have one, maybe two, in all the, in those ensembles. Okay, now let's listen to a portion of the third movement of Benedetto Marcello's Sonata in A minor. <laughs> Okay, you mentioned earlier different types of clarinets and the soprano clarinet, which is probably the most common one that you see. What is the average price for a decent soprano clarinet out there? Well, if you get a wooden one, there's two levels. One is what's called a step-up model or a student kind of semi-advanced model, and then one's the advanced. Uh, the student model runs about mm, 1,200, 1,500, something like that. It's wood, but it doesn't have uh, as nice a tone, or as nice as intonation, maybe even the keys aren't as nice. The professional models run about 3,000, 3,200. If you get silver-plated keys and some of this fancy stuff in there, add another couple of hundred to it, so maybe 35. It's nowhere near as much as the other woodwinds. Yeah. All of the other woodwinds are more expensive than yeah. the clarinet. Yeah. Now, how easy it is for a clarinet player who has received his or her major training in a particular type of clarinet to move into other type of clarinet, maybe to the most extreme ones, like the piccolo, the contrabass? If a person plays soprano clarinet, it's pretty easy to go to the higher clarinets, the piccolo, um, E-flat clarinet, because the embouchure and the way you blow and the way you finger is very similar. The Piccolo clarinets are a little smaller, so the fingering is a little tighter and it's a little closer. But you pretty much blow the same way and hold it the same way, and it looks like a regular clarinet, just a little mini clarinet. As soon as you hit alto clarinet, bass clarinet, contra bass clarinet, there's a big difference. Um, the size of the instrument is a factor with hands. The mouthpiece and reed are much larger, and so it's a different type of feeling in the mouth. The mouthpiece goes in the mouth rather, 
um, kind of straight in rather than at an angle. And then the embouchure has to be more like a saxophone embouchure in order to accommodate it. And the blowing is not as strong. A person who plays soprano clarinet playing right on bass clarinet would probably instantly squeak or play it, um, overblow it, or play mm -hmm. it badly. So there's a whole um, aspect of trying to learn the lower clarinets in particular as much different than the upper. That's one of the reasons I wanted to do the CD was to, for me to feel this and to be more proficient on the way I can teach the differences between the two and help the students to get a good direction right away without having to guess as to what to do and to you know, kind of futzle around and try and get uh, something that they can play or blow just by accident. Mm -hmm. No, I need to be able to teach them with good direction and good ideas. Just a curiosity, how many clarinets do you own? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm kind of a thrower-outer, so I have a, a B-flat, an A, and my own bass. Okay. That's it. Oh, through my life, I've had more than that, but I tend not to, even at home, I, my wife can verify this, that my desk, uh, each drawer has about three things in it, and that's it. So I don't really keep old things too much. <laughs> Learn too much, much, much of no. stuff. Okay. <laughs> well, in the minute or so that we have left, tell us about your next big project. Are you thinking about some other recording or a composition? What are you working on? Well. Uh, my first recording in 96, it, this was not a sabbatical recording, this is one that we did um, on our own, was a recording of trios for clarinet, viola, and piano. And we did a number of uh, compositions that had never been recorded before, mm -hmm. and we did them in the Sheldon Concert Hall. And at that time I was doing research on clarinet, viola, piano music. I got about a hundred pieces that I wanted to do. In that was a um, early piece that was c relatively unknown, has not been printed, and actually needs to, I think, be worked out on finale, actually be sent to a printer, uh, published, and be known in the clarinet world as an, I won't call it a new piece, but it's an unknown piece. Okay. Well, thank you very much to Mark Hinson about this interesting conversation on clarinet. Uh, he's in the Department of Music at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. And next week, we're going to have Professor Nasli Agun, a Fulbright Scholar visiting Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, who will be talking about teaching Turkish to the world. So stay tuned. This has been Segway with Dean Aldemaro Romero production of the Department of Mass Communications at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. All rights reserved, 2014.